I was asked to give you a talk called, I put a fancy, I'm a university academic, by the way, uh, but don't hold that against me. Um, I was raised in Yukon and grew up in a, in a sort of a town and a city environment where the trades were absolutely essential to the sort of the economy. Uh, most of my high school friends went on to the trades and it was a very big part of sort of the way Yukon operated. <clears throat> so I, but I've, the way I work now, I'm a university professor and I work in the area of sort of new technologies. And the real question is like, what's gonna happen? So at the very end, I'm gonna sort of raise the question of sort of, are we preparing people for the year 2050? Are we really doing a good job of getting people ready, not for tomorrow, you have to do that. You have to get people for the jobs of tomorrow. But when you start thinking of young people coming out of high school and coming out of you know, first year college or whatever, you gotta get them ready for 2050. That's gonna be a sort of a pretty key part of their lives. So uh, just a couple of, of quick stories because I, I wonder when you sit here in this room, um, and partly it's because I'm so much older than all of you, that, that um, I don't know if you really get a sense of the fact that you're sitting in the middle of a revolution. That what you, just, just being here today is in, the, in my history um, an absolutely remarkable thing to see happen. So I'm not really that old. I know I look a bit old, but I'm not that old. But in the middle of the 1960s, we had segregation in many, many parts of this, of this country. Um, the first time I went to um, the movie theater, um, I started going up the stairs to the balcony. I thought, oh, balcony upstairs, right? And somebody grabbed me from the rest from the movie theater in Whitehorse and said, you don't go up there, the Indians sit upstairs. And the Aboriginal people, I, later on I discovered they got the best seats and the white guys had the bad seats, but, that's, but that wasn't why they did it. There's only weren't very many seats up there. But that's not that long ago. Many communities had illegal um, curfews where Aboriginal folks had to get out of town in the evening, and particularly in the summertime, had to get out of town by, by dark. Um, which is really great in the Yukon, because it doesn't get dark. <laughs> so what do you do about a curfew when you say you have to leave at dark time, and dark is at maybe 45 seconds at midnight? Um, but it's really important to sort of keep this in mind, so that as you sit down and think about what's possible, do keep a little bit in mind as to how we've come from where we were. And, and I remember very much, I was worked on a highway crew, and so I was one of the unskilled people on the highway crews. I used to put in road signs. Doesn't that sound exciting? Uh, it's not. Um, just digging holes and putting in the road signs and all that kind of stuff. But there was a guy who worked in our shop named Howard. And Howard was, at that time, the only Aboriginal person working in a shop that hold, hired about 400 people. And the thing that stood out about Howard was two things. Number one was that he was the most skilled grader operator in that part of the Yukon. Really, really good guy. My father was a highway engineer and worked for a long time and he'd known Howard for years and he said, this guy, you got a big problem to fix. This guy can do absolutely anything. The second thing was, is that nobody talked to Howard. Um, he came into work 35 seconds before work started. He sat in his car outside, came inside, got his assignment, went back into his vehicle, took his lunch with him, didn't come in at lunch, everybody else came in at lunchtime, brought his machine back, you know, 35 minutes, 35 seconds before he had to close up for the day. Everybody else would sort of wash up and use the shower and all that kind of stuff. He wouldn't. He'd just go home. And I never, as a, I was a teenager at the time, never got to know Howard very well. Um, but I really wonder what that was like. And why was he so separated from everybody else? He was every bit as skilled as anybody else. He was a talented, talented tradesperson. But they had no time for him. Um, and he was not welcome into their, into their midst. Um, look, look what you just did today. Look what you did over the last two days. You sat in a room with people from all sectors, from the training sector, from indigenous communities, organizations, indigenous leaders, um, sat there with the people from post-secondary institutions and from industry, and had really, I can just see, just really good, fruitful conversations. Unheard of in the 1960s. Not really part of life back then at all. Um, but let me jump forward and give you a story from 2017, or 18, happened in the wintertime. So a new mine opening up in British Columbia. We sort of do that on a weekly basis, it seems, um, just out, outside of Kamloops. And the story that was interesting, it was all excited because this new mine was the first one in, in British Columbia to use autonomous trucks. Now, autonomous trucks are coming along like crazy. They're really, really good. Autonomous trucks are safer. Um, they don't take breaks. Uh, they don't go on strike. Uh, they don't cost very much for employees. They actually maintain themselves kind of thing, right? And the story was interesting. I, I, Mining companies have to use autonomous trucks. Don't get mad at them for using it, even though they displace workers, right? Because in order to be competitive in the 21st century, you have to take advantage of whatever technologies are there, because everybody else is. And so if you insist on using really expensive systems, when you've got a less expensive system, you're gonna lose out. 
So the part of this story that was really interesting was it was talking about these new autonomous trucks and, and about how this mine was going to go along and how it was going to be more efficient and more profitable. And at the very end, the journalist, it wasn't the company talking, the journalist said, and the best thing about this was nobody wanted those jobs anyway. I'm sorry. When you look at Aboriginal people working into the industrial economy, working into the resource sector, very many of them are entering at sort of very basic skilled level things like truck drivers. They might go along and learn more equipment later on. They might get along into management. They can move from there. But the entry point has always been things like trucking. And so this journalist very flippantly sort of said, oh, it doesn't matter. Nobody wanted those jobs anyway. And they paid about $80,000, $85,000 a year in a small, isolated area where there are no other jobs for Indigenous people close at hand. They don't want those jobs. You got it all wrong. You got it all wrong, which is kind of an interesting, interesting thing. So what's the new reality? Well, the new reality is really interesting. If you, again, go back 150 years, and I'm not that old, so you go back 150 years and think, where, where have we sort of come from? 150 years ago, we found some mechanisms to put Aboriginal people on the margins of the Canadian economy. And I don't say this to get anybody feeling bad or guilty. This is just a historian telling you what happened. By the time, but it's interesting, in most places, including the Okanagan, the real crisis really hit in the 1960s. If you go back and talk to people who were lived here in the 50s and the 40s and all that sort of stuff, Indigenous people were actually really active. They worked in some parts, they worked in ranching, they worked in agriculture, they worked casually here and casually there, they hunted, they fished, they trapped, they did a whole bunch of things, right? The 1960s, we had this wonderful Canadian invention called the social welfare state, where we basically imposed a culture of welfare dependency on Indigenous folks. And if you ever, you do me one favor, if you ever hear people saying, oh, Indigenous people like that welfare stuff, please tell them they're wrong. Please tell them they're categorically wrong. It is not something they chose. It was imposed on them. Um, in fact, we had a lot of Aboriginal people were traveling with their kids in the, in the wintertime, going off in different places. Government says you can't do that anymore. Kids have to go to school. We want them to come to school. You have to stay in one place. Oh, don't worry. We'll give you a house and we'll give you some money. And only 15, 20 years later, people realized the implications of all of that and how it basically undermined their traditional economy and all those sorts of things. And it's actually the, the crisis that we talk about in indigenous communities is actually a, f a function of the 1960s and 1970s. It wasn't created in the 19th century or 1940 or 1930s. It's actually relatively clear to, to our time. So what have we done? Well, in aboriginal communities across the country, only 24% of aboriginal kids graduate from high school. And that's actually a generous number. Turns out the federal government was misrepresenting the number uh, quite, a, quite a bit. Um, Unemployment is rampant in Aboriginal communities. Um, the work ethic, I always find this so funny because you'll hear people say, oh, Aboriginal folks don't have any work ethic. Um, they don't know how to work, they don't know how to work hard. Have you ever gone hunting with an Aboriginal person? I, I used to go in the Yukon from, from friends of mine who are Aboriginal folks and we go hunting and they go, oh, please don't work so hard. You know, it's exhausting. Uh, Aboriginal folks are capable of working harder than everybody, as, as, as much as anybody. Um, but we managed to sort of take away that part of their culture and take away that part of their lives in some interesting ways. So that's the bad news. But the good news is we're actually changing that and changing it very dramatically. We sit now in British Columbia and in Canada for the first time in 150 years with the opportunity in front of us to actually share prosperity with Indigenous peoples for the first time in a century and a half. To actually create an economy where Indigenous peoples are workers, they're business people, they're entrepreneurs, they're managers, they're owners, they're self-governing self -governing indigenous communities. That's really quite remarkable. Because First Nations, Métis people across this country have done that basically by themselves over 40 years. How did they do it? They went to court. They fought for constitutional recognition in, the, in 1982. Now these court decisions, you know, you have things coming down the line, duty to consult and accommodate 2004, and all how that changed the resource economy. They fought and they fought and they fought. And if you haven't noticed, you're still fighting. There's still a lot of places where First Nations and Aboriginal people aren't very happy with the way things are going. But they've also started the most fascinating revolution in, in, in Indigenous business in Canadian history. The Indigenous business community is the single fastest growing part of the Canadian economy. When was the last time somebody told you that? You should see how fast it's growing. 15 years ago, young people who wanted to make a difference, Aboriginal people who wanted to make a difference in their communities went into law. 
went into education, went into social work. Everybody needed teachers, they needed social workers, they needed lawyers to go and fight all these battles. Watch them now. They're going into engineering, they're going into the skilled trades, they're going into business development, into entrepreneurship. And when you look at how many young people there are, young Aboriginal people coming forward, there are many that still have significant issues and challenges. Anybody who pretends that otherwise just hasn't been in the communities for very much, right? They're there. So we are now looking at, I think, a most remarkable transfer transformation where we will absolutely, as a country, figure out a way to share prosperity with Aboriginal people. You know, the, did you hear the announcements today, or the, not the announcements, the suggestion today that the federal government might give um, Indigenous key people Trans Mountain Pipeline? So you buy a pipeline that nobody wants to build and you make, spend a whole bunch of money on it and then say, well, it's no good, so let's give it to First Nations. Ah, good idea. Um, the interesting thing about that is there was no big pushback. People didn't start screaming, oh, this is outrageous, how dare you think about that. The reaction in the country has been interesting. It's going, yeah, actually, sharing prosperity with Aboriginal folks is not such a bad idea. And is this the right mechanism? Interestingly, if you know anything about the Indian Resource Council, it represents 130 oil and gas producing First Nations. Did you know there were 130 oil and gas producing First Nations who currently get money off of the development of natural resource energy economy, right? They were already been talking for six months about buying Trans Mountain. They want to have control of the future. They want to have wealth creation at the center part, center point of their lives. So as you think about this, realize, as you do, this is your field even more than mine, is that you must find a way to get Indigenous people into the workforce, to get into the right kind of jobs, the right kind of opportunities, and the trades area, I think, is one of the most important. It has long been. It's one of the places where Indigenous people connect up with the economy in a major way. It has some really interesting links to you, people who get in the trades who then migrate into entrepreneurship and business. I met a guy one time and he'd, he sold his company. And so he called me in to come to a meeting with him because they were trying to figure out a way to sort of expand indigenous business. And so I thought he'd, he'd been on Fort Mac and he'd sold his firm. And he said, well, I've, I've got a bunch of money. My wife's tired of having me around the house and she wants me to do some more things. And so finally I thought, well, what are we talking about here? Are we talking about you've had a garage and you've sold it and you now got half a million dollars in the bank? What are you talking about? And he finally says, this, no, I sold it for $400 million. He was a tradesman. He was a welder. He sold a company for $400 million. Is he alone? Not a chance. There are lots of folks who are doing that kind of thing in different places. So we now have this odd situation, completely the contrast of what everybody tends to think, where the natural resource economy has become the front line of reconciliation. It's the place where indigenous and non-indigenous peoples are finally sort of finding common ground. Isn't that odd? In British Columbia, you think, oh, this is all about Trans Mountain, and everybody hates the pipeline, and blah, blah, blah. The reality is there's actually a very large number of First Nations support the pipeline very strongly. And then did you notice the other day, Monday, LNG Canada? It's not really a $40 billion project. It sounds nice. It's smaller than that. But maybe it's only $20 billion in terms of domestic impact. They need 10,000 employees. This is the greatest opportunity for indigenous workers to be trained, to move into the economy very quickly. It's absolutely astonishing. And if you see what's lined up behind it, there are more pipelines, more LNG factories and refineries sort of under development. There's an indigenous group that's lobbying and, and working toward uh, the, the establishment of a railway that would go from Fort Mac all the way to Alaska. There's big projects coming down. They need people to build them. They need skilled tradespeople to take on those jobs. There will be thousands of jobs in the natural resource sector. We have a problem getting young people into the trades. This is your world, so you know it more than I do. I work in the university. We've over oversold universities terribly. We bring an awful lot of people to university who shouldn't be there. They should be, they more properly go into the trades. They're more properly going into the skilled areas. They, why do they go there? Because their parents wanted them to go to university. You know, my daughter's going to UBC. Not my daughter's being an apprenticeship. You know, they should be just as proud of the second as they are of the first, but that's not the way it actually happens. So we got a challenge in a whole bunch of ways. Um, young people are not getting as much exposure to working with their hands. I was, my, my favorite example, my daughter who's 17 years old had a bunch of her friends over and were sitting around chatting about things and they kept making funny comments about working with her hands and you know, I kept asking, well, did you ever build anything? Well, why would I build something? You know, we can hire somebody to do that, right? So I said, well, how many of you have changed a tire on a car? 
This is pretty low entry stuff here, right? Everybody knows how to change a tire in a car. Well, there were 14 of them in the room. Not one of them had ever changed a flat tire. So I said, well, what would you do if you had a flat tire? Phone CAA. My daughter said, not me. And I was really proud. She said, I'd phone my dad. <laughs> ah, not such a good thing, actually, right? So what we actually need, when you start thinking about how you get people into the trades, you've got to work on the young people and get them excited. You have to get them into a hands-on situation where they actually learn how to build something, how to work something, how to make a chainsaw work, how to take apart an outboard motor, to work on those things. If they don't have that, getting them into the trades is a bridge too far. It's really hard to take somebody from sort of a suburban, sort of middle-class environment who never fixed anything and all of a sudden have them working on heavy equipment. It just doesn't work very well. You've got to work on their parents. You've got to talk to parents about the fact that this is a wonderful and viable opportunity. People in the skilled trades have really good careers. They make a lot of money, a lot of flexibility. You can try and take their work all over the world. When we had this horrible tragedy in Saskatchewan. I mean, where where uh, 12 uh, tradespeople from Saskatoon were actually killed in a helicopter crash. That's a terrible sort of thing. They were killed in Kazakhstan. They had a Saskatchewan company had got a big contract to work on a mine in Kazakhstan. A horrible, horrible disaster. But when you sort of realize what were they doing over there, well, there were dozens and dozens and dozens of them working internationally and doing very well. We have to make sure that the communities support this, you have to work with sort of you know, your educational training advisors, some of whom are here, uh, to sort of get this sort of whole thing sort of on the roads. So, but that was kind of then and that was not, not where we're going. So now I get you all excited about doing something for tomorrow, this is all really good. Um, how many people have ever heard of something called HRP5P? I'd be blown over with a feather if anybody here had ever heard of HRPSP or 5P. This is actually a Japanese robot. And if you, if you Google this and take a look at it, you'll be absolutely blown away. You know what this robot does? It actually installs drywall. And so what happens is they get this wonderful thing where there's this room like this, right? They've, all you have is stripped down to the, to, to, the, to the two by fours and the studs and whatever, right? And this machine goes over by itself, picks up by itself a big sheet of, of drywall, picks it up, turns it around, walks it over, puts it up exactly where it's supposed to go, way more accurately than most humans will ever do, nails it in, boom, 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 like this, and in the second stage, you can come back around and do the mudding and stuff later on. It's a machine. It's a machine. It can take all the work of drywaller. Now, that's kind of scary. You're sitting here, I'm a drywall instructor, going, what is this guy talking about? He's talking about destroying my career and destroying the opportunities for young people. We are in the middle of the biggest technology and scientific revolution in human history. More than 90% of all the scientists and technology researchers who've ever lived are actually walking on the earth today. The explosion of universities and colleges and tech schools, absolutely unbelievable. And we're seeing some really fascinating technologies emerge and, and some of them very, very quickly. My uncle, this is 25, 30 years ago, worked for CIL, the explosive company. And one of the projects he worked on, worked for the, when they were planning the McKenzie Valley uh, uh, pipeline, was on explosive welds. And they worked out a system where instead of having welders come in and doing this traditional weld, they actually pack these things and you boom, blow them up. And the next thing you know is you have a real fusion of the sort of pieces of steel. Now we're looking at digital technologies, the like of which we've never seen before. And the digital technologies are simply stunning in terms of what they can do and the impact that they'll have. And now we're moving toward artificial intelligence, where you've got thinking machines that can actually solve problems and deal with those kinds of things. I'm a huge fan of robotics, generally. Robotics are doing some astonishing things. We're not very good at that in Canada. We're okay in the industrial robotics. We've got Japanese companies bringing in machines to build cars in southern Ontario. We don't sit there and think, well, how many jobs did we lose when we brought those machines in? The, the calculus is really simple. If you have a human being doing a job and you can buy a machine for $100,000, buy the machine. When companies are looking at the possibilities, it's kind of in that range. It all varies by industry and stuff like that. But if you can buy a machine for $100,000, you'll do it. Other countries are miles ahead of us. 